Who are you? My name's Keith Morris. I'm the vocalist. And as I said before, I'm the most important person here because of my seniority. Uh, please, Keith, introduce the new lineup of Off. This would be Mr. Autry Fulbright the second, And you will know us by the Trail of the Dead. You used to know me by the Trail of the Dead. You could still purchase a record with him playing bass on it. How many how many records of theirs did you play on? I think about six. That's six more than I knew about. Now, <laughs> now, now the guy standing next to Autry, who is part of our new rhythm section, that's Mr. Justin Brown. Mr. Justin Brown played with Herbie Hancock, and you just don't get to play with Herbie Hancock. That's just something way beyond... That's kind of like free LSD. It's like way out there. It's like being the manager of Thundercat. <laughs> Management team, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's funny how that all coincides each other, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's Dimitri on the end. You know Dimitri. You've talked with Dimitri before. From Burning? Brides. Here in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada with... Off. Off at Neptune Records. Nardwar. He was very skeptical about doing this. And we had to hold him down on the ground with both of his arms behind his back and a gun to his head and said, you are going to do this with us. No, I'm just kidding. We, we wouldn't do that. Why is the record called Free LSD? Because the music is the truck. And you are? Oh, my name's Keith. And I have a vocalist. <laughs> and I have a gift for you right off the bat. The 1966 Guide to Taking LSD. This is fantastic. On colored vinyl. Check that out. I will listen to this once my stereo system gets set up correctly. And a four-page booklet as well. Well, let me see the booklet. Oh, and this looks like something written by Dr. Timothy Leary. Okay. And the vinyl is incredible. Check out the vinyl right there, the colors. Nardwar, who taught you how to handle vinyl? You don't just grab the vinyl. You grab it by the edge. You don't want your fingerprints on the vinyl because it'll ruin the sound of the record. How dare I do that? Didn't anybody ever tell you that? You, you've you listened to records all your life, and now I'm, I'm here to school you? Well, you're accepted. Like, come off like your dad, like I'm some kind of authority? I gave this to you as a gift. Are you allowed as a gift giver to touch vinyl like that? You can if you want to because you did give it to me. So, and, yeah, I'll allow that. And that's a gift for you. I won't but touch it again. If somebody were, were to come into my house and pull a record out of my record collection or my record library and touch the vinyl like that, I live upstairs. You know what? You know what the sound of a human body sounds like? tumbling downstairs Ugh, get out of here and keith still has it he still got it you passed the test thank you thank you when did you first hear of keith oh i was probably about 11 or 12 years old uh, i heard some music in the other room and i asked somebody to turn it off <laughs> Turned out it was him. And what about you, Justin? When did you first hear about Keith? Uh, well, I, they had mentioned Black Flag, and I knew like Henry Rollins like Black Flag, you know. And then I was introduced to Circle Jerks. You know, I'm a bad brains guy, you know, but Circle Jerks I was unfamiliar, and that's when I heard about Keith Morris and. Actually, that's not true. Atri actually introduced me to Keith Morris via the old off videos. That, oh, yeah. That's actually the real introduction. But I will say, getting into the mix, learning about Keith, when I saw him, I was like, he looks familiar. And then when I listened 
to Circle Jerks, uh, Dimitri played me Red Tape, and I was like, oh shit, like, this is not a game. And that was my introduction to Keith. And the next thing you know, I'm watching him on the Grammys and on, on YouTube fucking shit up, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I have won several Grammys. <laughs> Now, let's turn this around. Well, actually, what about Dimitri? When did you first hear Keith? Well, you know, um, I I didn't really grow up with uh, punk rock, so when I first heard about Keith, we met, and we just hit it off. And at the pool. You met at the pool. That's right, at John Seidel's pool. He was swimming in a pool. Well, that's he was swimming in a pool. That's normally what you do during the summertime at a swimming pool. You swim, ba boom. And um, I just thought, like, who the hell is this strange guy? And he was shooting up. Like I thought he was shooting up drugs, but it turns out he's a diabetic, and it was insulin. That's what that's what diabetics have to do. And then. Um, we just uh, started hanging out, going record store shopping, getting bites to eat, and I didn't really care where he came from or who he was. He's my buddy. Audrey, let's move the conversation towards you. I have a gift for you in this towel right here. Oh, wow. It's Gibby Haynes. A throbblehead. It is. Yeah. From Texas. Indeed. And you have a throbble head too, don't you, Keith? I do. What do you think about the Gibby throbble head? First off, I love Gibby. He's one of the greatest human beings to ever walk the face of the earth. But there's another thread here because Gibby lived in Austin, Texas for a while. Just like Audrey. I did live in Austin, Texas for a fortnight. Did you have any encounters with Gibby? I don't think that I had any interaction with Gibby. From what I remember, um, I think I just had very peripheral connection with them because I was in Trail of Dead, and they put out a record by them, like a cassette in the mid-90s, long before I joined, but um, this is amazing. This is awesome. I love it. This is my first uh, throbble head as well. And thank you, Johnny Foreman. He set you on your journey. Wait, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Foreman, how do you, okay, of all things, Johnny Foreman, yeah. A mohawked Johnny Foreman. Yes, indeed, that is pretty insane. Yeah, Johnny Foreman was this guy that I knew, he was an upperclassman in high school, he had a mohawk, and he was on the football team, which totally blew my mind, because there were these rules that punk rockers wanted to say, you couldn't listen to Grateful Dead, you couldn't play sports. Johnny did both, and it kind of normalized punk to me as something that was accessible to anyone. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty unbelievable that you know about Johnny Foreman. Well, you are Autry. We have to know. Wow. That's cra- <laughs> that, that I wasn't expecting at all. <laughs> merch. And I was curious, this merch right here, what can you tell the people about this merch? Some Circle Jerks merch, customized. Oh. Come on now, Nardwar. We're here to talk about off, and I don't really need to be talking about the circle jerks. Now, this is yours, obviously. Customized. Customized. Check out like the spray paint. Leaves on it, and you spray paint the back, and you were probably uh, lifting weights thinking that you were going to compete with Henry Rollins. And did you get some, like, really bad tattoos? Did you go out and get, like, a couple of dozen really bad homemade tattoos? Baboom, I think it's amazing. It's held up. The T-shirt has held up, and so has Keith. Oh, uh, yeah, he's still going. Like, to have Keith as your singer, that's am- Let's give a round of applause. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Now that you've embarrassed me in front of my band. <laughs> and Justin, I have a gift for you right here. A Cozy Coal promo pick from the 1950s. Yeah, that's crazy. Cozy Coal, man. Innovator of Big Band. And uh, there's a lot to say about Cozy. <laughs> and that's a gift for you. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson Brooks. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah wow 
Yeah, Wilson Brooks was uh, one of the first drummers I ever saw play in life. Um, wow, that's crazy. Um, yeah, he was uh, a friend of my mom. Uh, my mother's a musician. And uh, yeah, I grew up watching Wilson Brooks play with my mother in church. And uh, yeah, he's the first person who taught me rudiments. Um, that is wild, dude. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, I used to call him Uncle Wilson, you know, because he was such a tight knit and close uh, individual to the family. But yeah, I learned everything from him. He was like the the catalyst or the start of like learning about the instrument and learning how to like listen and but that's crazy, man. That's that's super wild. I used to watch him play all the time. Like I have crazy memories of him. Of uh, like, he used to work a, a a night job, and sometimes late in church, the musicians, my mom, they would just hang out and jam. And one night, a friend who played bass called him at like I don't know. It could have been any time at night, and he was like, "Man, you gotta come do it. You gotta." come do it for me and uh wilson shows up in his like he worked at an oil rigs or some like gas company or something so he showed up in his suit oil all on him and he just walks in picks up the drumsticks and plays this crazy drum solo i don't know what it was but uh that's like the spark of everything for me as a drummer and Justin, I have some more gifts for you. Some downbeat magazines on the cover is... Elvin Jones. <laughs> and if we go underneath, we have the percussion issues of downbeat. What? This is crazy, man. Who do we have there? We got Art Blakey, Roy Burns, and Chico Hamilton. Wow, dude. These are like original prints that... I have know this photo, right? Check out the ads. Don't know this. Joe Jones, too. That's Joe Jones? Oh, shit. It is Joe Jones. This is crazy, bro. They were, like, Downbeat was showing drummers love back then. And check out the ads, too. Like, the wait, ads. Wait, what are some of the ads you got, Mark? What is this? That's a maestro. Uh, a that's drum a drum machine. machine. Help me understand. They're advertising a drum machine in, in a drum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wonder what people were thinking when they saw that. I don't know. Were, are they trying to hint that some of these dudes were about to be using these machines or something like that i don't know how to eat but, but those are some gifts for you this is crazy man this is super crazy this is amazing i can't wait to investigate and read this stuff and yes i do have time to read on the road dimitri what were the sailor jerry gigs like they were pretty crazy weren't they yeah um they were fun they were free for people um and um, when we did those, uh, we, we prided ourselves on the original lineup not having any tattoos. So a lot of those Sailor Jerry events, people were getting tattooed. And I mean, we were, I think we were even interviewed in, for Tattoo Magazine because we had no tattoos. It's like a rare thing. Aside from the tattoos, the Sailor Jerry gigs were very drunk, weren't they? Drunk audience. There was a lot of booze. Well, isn't that at every show? Not at every show. Like free drink tickets at the Sailor Jerry gigs. What were they like? You had to oftentimes play, oftentimes play your set twice? Because we didn't have that many songs yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think we would encore with like the same set. <laughs> they were like, play it twice. It's the same thing Black Flag did. When I left Black Flag, we had 16 songs. Our set was 15 minutes in total so people would go crazy and want to hear more so we would come back out and we would play the entire set over again and dimitri i have a gift for you a beatles in vancouver 1964 bootleg this is awesome that's a greatest rock band of all time and if we, Keith would agree with me on that. And if you turn it over, check out this bootleg. Look what it says. Concert off PA system. But that was actually a bootleg put out by Jack Cullen, who bootlegged this gig in Vancouver. It's a two LP set. I um, would like to uh, inform everybody that one of the greatest bootleg albums of all time is David Bowie and the Spiders from Mars in December of 1972 at the Santa Monica Civic. 
I happened to be there for one of the nights, and it was one of the most amazing rock and roll performances that I've ever seen. Well, I thought to welcome you to Vancouver, Beatles in Vancouver. Although, Dimitri, have you got this record before? Do you have it? No, I don't even know about it. And uh, um, I'd like to thank you for giving this to me. You're very kind. Oh, sure, no problem. And I thought you could listen and learn a bit about the flavor of Vancouver from the radio coverage. Have you listened to it? It's amazing. Yes, I have. It's, it's incredible. They kick into the tunes. Do they sound good? Yes, it's really good quality. It's really good quality, despite saying it's a PA recording. I'm really excited to hear it. And this is a gift for you, Keith. A Marilyn Monroe poster. And Marilyn Monroe is probably one of the most beautiful women of all time. And an inspiration for Blow Mind and this new record. I don't remember um, her being an inspiration for uh, Blow Mind, but I do remember... That's your podcast. I, I re yes, I, I, I remember that, yes. Uh, I haven't lost all of my brain capabilities. Um, in the Blow Mind segment that she's mentioned, it's because of the Kennedy brothers, both having... Um, been lucky enough to have slept with her and that's part of the conspiracy as to who killed Marilyn and that's a misfit song and that does relate though to off though the blow mind free LSD connection Dimitri absolutely yep Keith's podcast is important right it is very important because um when we were trying to figure out how we were going to change things up and do something different than we'd done on our first three records, you know, I just said, well, I'm going to start just tuning my tuning pegs and just, uh, I'm going to just start, start turning them until it sounds different and good. And, um, I started to come up with this language on the guitar that I was, I was kind of into. And then Keith was like, well, how am I going to change it up? You know, I sing about politics. I sing about things that I read in the paper and I said well Keith you're just as passionate when you talk about all these things that you feature on your show as mainstream politics so let's go there and let's come to Neptune Records with the band oh. and Justin I have another gift for you some Tony Williams records <laughs> come on bruh. Uh, <laughs> what can you say about Tony Williams? A gateful, check that out. Well, you covered some Tony Williams, too. <laughs> I sure did. I covered a song, Circa 45, on this Ego album, on my album. Amazing drumsticks, though. What can you say about Tony Williams, though? Like, I love the drumsticks. I mean, Tony Williams is a master, you know? Uh, he. Th we were just listening to Tony Williams upstairs on... Uh, I think you, someone had Andrew Hill, uh, maybe point of departure or something. Uh, yeah, he was like, I don't know, maybe 19, 18, 19, 20. Tony Williams is like a god um, when it comes to jazz drums. Uh, Joy of Flying. Yeah, I have like shoes made out of this album. But uh, yeah, he's literally... Shoes? Yeah, uh, this, oh man, what's, maybe Brian, something, he made me these vans that, you know... It was the cover of this album on the Van Shoes. But Tony Williams, man. Tony Williams is literally like the god of gods of for drumming and fusion drumming and even rock drumming, you know? So. Well, that's a gift for you. Maybe some more copies for you. Oh, man. Thank you, man. This is, this is crazy. This is super crazy. I really appreciate this. And right now, something better change. DOA 1980. What can you say about Joey Shedhead, Chuck Biscuits, and rest in peace, Randy Rampage? I saw these guys open for X at a place called the Starwood. And they came out... It was one of the most amazing things that I've ever seen. I hadn't seen the bad brains yet. Nobody touches the bad brains. These guys, they were they were doing it very, very, very early on, and they were very inspirational for a lot of bands. And they paved the way, didn't they? Like, not only with music, but with contacts, too. They would get in their van and go. And go, and go, and go, and go. And 
Then they would come back here to Vancouver and be here maybe for a month and then they would go back out again. This was at a point in time where everybody would get in their vans and be gone for a minimum three to four months, five months at a time. Just playing any any place, anywhere, any town, any city, anybody's backyard, a pool party, in the garage, the basement, like Black Flag, the guys that went out and basically made the map that millions of bands have followed. And I have a gift for you, Autry, a seaweed seven inch. So you're blowing my mind right now because I was a huge, huge, still am forever a huge seaweed fan. I remember a trip with my family where uh, I tried to buy any seaweed album I possibly could find. And this is an original seaweed 7-inch. This is incredible because I don't think I really talk that much about seaweed to anyone, but they were definitely one of my favorite groups of all time. I was curious, when was the last time you cut your dreads? I have cut my dreads twice, and the pieces that I have are probably, what, about 36, 42 inches long. So if I had never cut them, everybody would be standing on them. And that would not, I wouldn't be able to move my head. No, I, I, um, the first time I cut them, I was having a difficult time because I would get in my car and I would close the door and I would go to look in the mirror as I was backing out of my driveway and I couldn't move my head. My head would just like stop. And so I realized also I live in a two-story building, and coming up the stairs, there's a certain point where part of the living room jets into the stairwell, and you've got to duck to get under the architectural mistake, and as I would duck, I would be standing on my dreads, and then I would get to the point where I could lift my head to continue going up the stairs and I would it would be almost like I was going to fall backwards down the stairs. So it's time to cut the cut the dreads. Do you still have your germs burn and what is it for people wondering what a germs burn is? You can just barely see it but it's right there and mine was given to me by Darby Crash who is the lead vocalist of the germs. So I have a real authentic now, what is that? What exactly is a germ's burn? Well, you're smoking a cigarette, and rather than putting it out in the ashtray, you put it out on somebody's wrist. Ouch. What is the difference, Justin, in playing an off versus Thundercat? Um, <laughs> well, with me, like, I try not to think about differences as far as, like, genres go. With music, I try to like just accept it for good or bad, morphing it as the same. But no, there are differences. I think the intensity and the physicality of off is a little bit more, uh, yeah, wearing <laughs> and a little bit more. Yeah, it's a little bit more uh, of a challenge in that sense. But Steven is a challenge, as I said, too, because it's just intense two hours. But... I think off is a little bit more intense for me because it's so new for me to play punk style of music. Um, it's not like I've been playing it all my life, so my body is not quite conditioned in that way, you know? So I think I need to build up some more chest muscles and keep eating kale and stuff like that. And But there, there I, I would like to say there, there's not much difference. It's like both amazing artists making good music, but the physicality is like, yeah, kicking my ass and, and off, yeah. December 7th, 1984, the Olympic, 5,000 kids. 5,000 crazy punk rock kids. And you are playing with this band from Winnipeg, the Stretch Marks. Do you remember the Stretch Marks at all? Um, I was um, shuffled in and shuffled out, so I didn't get to see uh, any of the bands. I, I think I got to see a little bit of the Vandals who played right after us. 
but I was in a uh, what they call a full body cast after I just got out of the hospital. I was in the hospital for eight weeks, and what they do before they release you is they create a cast of your body, and they created what they call a full body cast that starts right above the buttocks and goes right to the top of the rib cage, right up here to the shoulders. And it's Velcro, and it's two pieces of plastic, and I was, it was pretty crazy because they, they uh, Gary Tovar had actually hired extra stage security to keep all of the... Um, we, we were told a new uh, term for a lot of these people last night when we played in um, Seattle, meat bags, to keep, keep the meat bags from jumping all over me. What had happened to you? I had crushed a lower lumbar vertebrae. I'd, I was pushed off a wall and I flew back about... Uh, I think it was about 30 feet and I was supposed to land on some soft grass, which would have been fine. Everything would have been good except for the one area of hard dirt that I landed on and uh, I immediately blacked out. And when I came to, I was in the, what they call the red room at County General Hospital, L.A. County General Hospital. And I woke up, and the doctor was standing over me, and he pulled out a needle, and he started poking me, started poking my feet to make sure that I hadn't lost, you know, that I didn't do sever my spinal cord, that I still had feeling in my feet, and... I told him to stop. I said, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you doing that? And then that's when my dad came in and saw me. And my dad was just like, this is fucked. This is ridiculous. They can't put you in traction. It, it's a break where you just lay there and you deal with the pain. Uh, being in county general, um, a lot of people will inflict self-wounds just so they can be admitted to the hospital so they can get the free drugs. And they look at certain people and say, well, he looks like he does drugs and he's here for the drugs, so we're not going to give him drugs. And what they gave me was Motrin, which is what they give women for menstrual cramps. And it didn't help, so it just got to the point where it's like, I'm just going to lay here and be miserable. It's like, why would I take that? It doesn't help. Forget it. But you did the gig still? Well, I had to do something when I got out of the hospital. I was, you know, <laughs> I needed to get out and, like, be around some people. What was it like playing at the Olympic? Like, for instance, Los Lobos got booed opening for Pill? Yeah, and they're one of the greatest bands to come out of southern california um what you have uh getting back to the meat meat bags is uh people that are unaware of um music that comes from other places being very close-minded well that's not punk rock um i don't like it so i'm gonna let them know that they suck you know that kind of scenario Los Lobos are one of the greatest bands to come out of Southern California. Dimitri, quote, a heavy punk industrial free jazz soundtrack recording. Yeah, that's what free LSD is to me. Yeah. Industrial, I have a gift for you right here. A 1988 promo by oh. SP. SPK. What can you tell the people about SPK and off? This is this is awesome. Yeah, SPK is, um, you know, I'm new to this whole uh, noise genre, industrial um, side of things. I mean, I always liked Throbbing Gristle and Einster Send a Neubauten, stuff like that. But uh, it wasn't until I, I moved to Claremont, California, 
and started hanging out with people like Scott Roosh from Hunting Lodge and uh, Henry Barnes from uh, Man is the Bastard and Bastard Noise um, and talking to people like W.T. Nelson, who was in Bastard Noise and has the company Trogatronic, that I really started to learn about um, other very influential uh, industrial artists like SPK. On Network Records from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. This is this is great. I really appreciate you giving are you giving me this. Yes, that's a gift for you. Thank you very much. Here we are at Neptune Records, winding up here. Neptune Records in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And when I think of Canada, I also think of some punk rock in Toronto, the legendary Diodes from Toronto. Do you remember playing with the legendary Diodes from Toronto? We played with the Diodes at a place called the Hong Kong Cafe. And the uh, critic from the LA Times disliked us, disliked our fans, because the majority of the people that were there weren't there to see the Diodes. And the Diodes, are, that first Diodes album, there's some really great pop songs on that record i would not consider the diodes to be a punk rock band just like i would not consider the descendants to be a punk rock band just like i would not consider the buzzcocks to be a punk rock band they're very 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 rooted in pop music beach boys listen to the ramones the ramones are highly highly influenced by the beach boys so hooray for the Beach Boys, hooray for the Ramones, hooray for all of the bands that I just mentioned. The Diodes, the kids that were the, the meat bags or our fans or whatever you want to call them, when they show up, they want to jump around, they want to move around, they're leaping off of the stage, they're rolling on the floor, they're banging each other, they're banging each other over the heads with like the chairs that are at the tables that jet out from the stage it gets crazy it gets wild and and they the diodes were scared and the la times critic said the circle jerks fans were terrible they were horrible and so were the circle jerks and the diodes were really good i don't know how they were able to do what they did because there was so much interference there were all those kids jumping up and down on stage and like knocking their equipment over and then the guy that criticized the circle jerks and all of our fans went on to become the uh food critic for the la times and you were the band off anything to add to the people out there at all off well tonight we are playing the rickshaw theater and it is only the fifth show ever with our stellar new lineup yeah it's gonna be tight it's been tight and it's gonna continue to grow and germinate <laughs> <laughs> i agree it's gonna be a lot of fun be there or don't stay home i mean you know it's your choice we're gonna have a good time the people that are gonna be there are gonna have a good time and they're going to applaud when we get through playing and tonight we could actually go off stage after we get through playing lsd in its entirety and look at each other and go good job fellas the people will be screaming and yelling and shouting and they'll be enthusiastic more 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 encore bravo hooray you guys are great and then we'll come back out and we'll play nine songs why should people care about off? Why should people care? Why shouldn't they care? That's the question. Well, thanks very much, off. Keep on washing your hands in the free world and do, 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 do. yeah. <laughs>